been talking this morning on uh, on stage, and uh, Rob Chandock, who is our SVP of Software Strategy and President of both QIS and Quick, which is our Qualcomm Innovation Center. So we've got about 15 or 20 minutes. We want to make this as interactive as possible, um, and we're here to answer any of the questions you may have. And uh, I shall turn it over now to. Uh, Steve and Rob, so uh, there will be microphones going around, so if you want to ask a question, just put your hand up and uh, we'll, uh, we will uh, pass you the mic. If you could just introduce yourself, tell which, say which publication you're from in your country, that would be great. So uh, we'll start the questions. Fire away. Come on, don't be shy. I saw this morning that Everything Everywhere in the UK has launched its 4G network um, and that at the moment there's no quad-core 4G phones at all in the UK and probably not for the rest of Everything Everywhere's network. Is there, is there any development on that? How long is it going to be before we start seeing Qualcomm branded 4G quad-core phones appearing in the UK and in Europe? Uh, I just saw the answer about that. 4G, I saw that also, but, um, you know, it, it, there will be, if there's going to be LTE phones, you can bet that we're going to be around them, but we're not making any announcements. We let our partners and our customers make those announcements. So you'd have to read what EE did. We're calling EE now, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I saw that also in the, in the Twitter feed that we're having a big ring in. Um, so it, it'd be hard for us to announce anything, but, you know, the amount of work that we do, I think you saw in Steve's talk, um, where we're not only taking what's existing with the LT stuff, but we're building it out in terms of, so the performance of our modems really is quite different. So operators, we think like E, will want to take advantage of that as they do the rollout, but we don't have anything specific to announce. Hi, good afternoon, Tawanda Chawata from uh, Comdot in the Middle East. Um, last year's um, IQ event in Istanbul, we saw some demos regarding uh, motion scrolling and uh, motion navigation. And I was just wondering if you could give us an update in terms of any commercialization of that kind of area and applications, please. So you're talking about like the gestural stuff, like the waving of the yeah. hand thing? Um, so we've, we've, we've uh, the demonstrations we showed in Istanbul, for those of you that weren't there, where we were showing a, a gesture-based UI where you would um, interact, say, with the movie application, where you would page through different movies and, and play it without actually touching the screen. Um, those, that kind of camera-based vision, uh, the, the research and sort of the APIs that we've been built up haven't, aren't present yet in any commercial applications. But um, some of the underpinnings of that for computer vision you saw demonstrated with the augmented reality stuff. So that the stuff that's below that is a library we call Fast TV for doing computer vision. And that's sort of the, the shared underpinning. But I don't, I, we don't have any specific gestural stuff that's come out yet. Somebody will grab your mic over here. And then you next. Uh, from uh, Journal de Geek in France. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, FPS, images per second, and uh, battery life, but what about performance per watt actually with the uh, Qualcomm chips, since uh, users are mainly interested in doing the most of their mobile phones while having a lot of battery life, and that is something that we, we don't actually see in our keynotes, is a uh, performance per watt. Yeah, so, so what we do, what, what we're different, I think, than other phone manufacturers in the, in the sense that we actually design our own CPU cores. They're based on the ARM instruction set, but we actually do our own implementation. And the reason that we do that primarily is to provide a better, uh, essentially, performance per watt metric than anybody else in the industry. Um, so for us, we. You know, if you were to look at our, and I think we, we have some data probably on our, we've done a couple of things on the website where we show that. But essentially our, our implementations, uh, we believe, are the best performing, uh, highest performing per watt mobile solutions. 
we essentially designed uh, for that. We did a couple of videos. We did a, a video once to show it with um, butter melting, for example, which was something that people can understand. But essentially, we have uh, videos running uh, that, that show thermal cameras of our uh, phones based off of our chipset versus other chipsets. And there's a pretty stark difference in terms of the, the temperature of the case because we design for a particular design point which is lower in terms of its thermal usage than, uh, than others. So uh, it's very, very, uh, uh, one of the key reasons that we do our own cores essentially is to provide the best performance per watt. Um, that's really what makes Snapdragon so, uh, so useful in the mobile environment. It's a good question. Hi, I'm Michele Costabile, PC professional in Italy. Uh, last year, I, I, I was very quite impressed by all join uh, because I am a strong believer in proximity-based networks. Uh, you can envision things like classroom networks, uh, support of consumers and supermarkets, and things like that. Uh, it strikes me that we have not seen yet um, commercial applications or uh, visible uh, efforts uh, going to the market. Uh, can you um, give some insight on that? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, you could be using actually at this conference the Visibu application, which is in the Android marketplace that uses AllJoin. Actually, you can see who's in your LinkedIn graph that's reachable near you. Right? So I just actually put it on my phone uh, this morning. Um, so what, where we are with AllJoin is, um, I think one of the things that we found as we were starting to deploy AllJoin is, is there's some challenges with the way people are setting up their Wi-Fi networks that actually make peer-to-peer -peer sharing harder. Wi-Fi Direct gets around, you know, sort of fixes that problem. So as devices come out with support for Wi-Fi Direct, with we're driving through our Theros um, uh, subsidiary too, uh, you're going to see a lot more commercial applications of AllJoin. There's about 20 applications in the Android marketplace actually right now, and in fact we had our first iOS application. Um, with AllJoin that launched actually just last week. That's a chat, a proxim proximal chat application. So um, there, there are, they are starting to come out. Actually, I think in 2013 you're going to start to see uh, quite a bit more applications. Hi, my name is Anton Carmen. I'm from Norcalu, Sweden. I have a few questions about the new Snapdragon S4 Pro. Uh, for one thing, can you say anything when we'll see these uh, ships and devices in Europe? We haven't asked that availability yet. Can you say something general? Uh, <laughs> no, we can't say. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, not even if we will see them this year, or it's. Uh, I, I would be unsurprised if it were this year, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, and one other thing, uh, the chip you've been showing us now is with the no, no baseband integrated. That's uh, correct. Do you have any information when we'll see the pro version quad core with uh, baseband integrated as well? Uh, it's in our roadmap, but we haven't announced when the commercialization of that chip will be. I mean, what we did is in our first round of 28 nanometer parts, the first one had the dual core plus the integrated multimode LT modem, and then what we did on the 8064, which is what you saw on the stage. So we actually took the space of, of the modem and added the, the two other cores, and then um, we, make, we can make some other trade-offs and actually get the quad core in there soon, but it's not in that, uh, not something that we're talking about commercially yet. Okay, so is that a trade-off more because that the quad core might be more uh, suited for tablets where baseband isn't 100% uh, needed, uh, or is it just... Uh, more, more about, I think, time to market and packaging is, as we moved into process nodes, I think that we, you know, we tend to segment our chips. Yes, there are places where an AP-only chip is the right chip, but that particular decision wasn't because we thought that chip was only for the tablet market. In fact, you'll see it in a bunch of phones. Okay. In fact, you'll see it in more phones than tablets. That's right. You, you, um, essentially, what we did was we, we picked a design point. Remember, we do, we do our own cores. Uh, ARM-based cores, and our, um, our new core, the one that's in the S4, actually has such high performance relative to the legacy cores that actually two of them actually beat four of the others. And so we came out, we, we said, our first chip, we said we could, do, we could do two cores, have the performance of a quad core, and have integrated LTE and connectivity, which is what we did. Then we came out with a, with a quad core that actually gets 
goes to market uh, with a separate chip that provides the LTE, and it can be used either in tablets or connected tablets or in phones. And then we've been on this kind of yearly cadence where we make these big jumps uh, with the processor. So um, you could envision sort of when the next big step will be based off of that. But essentially, we've been on this, you know, every year come out with a with a brand new uh, device, and, and we'll probably be on that cadence for some time. Uh, just one quick question again about uh, the differences when having in integrated baseband and having a separate chip. If yep. you compare, uh, for example, the two core Snapdragon S4 that you have in both uh, versions, how more energy e efficient is it when you have it integrated into the into the SOC itself, so to speak? Well, there's a couple of advantages of integration. The first one is that you don't... Um, uh, the cost point that you can enable because you essentially can, you know, you don't have to pay for the extra packaging, you can put it all together as well as you can abstract all the complexity away from using the device. If you have multiple chips and you're trying to get them to work across multiple companies, it's very difficult to get to market rapidly. So that's one of the biggest advantages of being integrated. Probably the biggest advantage for us, and there's, there's, there are advantages to being integrated in terms of you don't have to spend power driving things off chip and, and you can control the system design better across one company, but the most important thing we did on S4 was that we, we came out with the newest variety of ARM cores, much more power efficient uh, at the same power, the same performance level. It's, it's quite, a, quite a reduction in terms of power. I can't remember the numbers were, but it was, it was, it was multiple tens of percent. And um, that was probably the biggest, biggest thing we did uh, in terms of lowering the power. We did that at the same, you know, we came out, uh, I don't think there's even been a competitive equivalent device out yet, and we're probably six months into the ramp of that device. So uh, we have quite a lead there, which really helped us in power. Cool. Uh, the absolute last question. <laughs> How confident are you with the performance of the Create architecture? You talked about your, yeah. the, the cores are more efficient than the Cortex-A9, of course. Uh, how, are, um, how are you seeing now when the A15 should be coming uh, uh, in the near future, future, it's well. We haven't seen them out. They're not on the market yet. So we, uh, we, we, um, but we're pretty confident that our design point we chose is is uh, is very competitive. Remember, what we do is we we don't have as broad a use case, and so we tend to tailor our our solution for purely for the mobile design point that we that we choose. It's one of our advantages, and and one of the ways that I think we've been partnering uh, with ARM. Through you know we use an architecture license so we're able to to adapt it for the you know what we need. Uh, whereas I think they may have a more broad use of that uh, core than we would. So therefore we're able to tailor it for our particular use. So it's, it's worked out well across the two companies I think. I think one of the big differences you'll see with A15 architectures is that, that with the crate you don't need to do big little kinds of architectures to get into a power saving mode. Think of it as the crate actually has a, a lower gear. Right, that you can run at a lower power without having to throw this data onto a smaller processor and uh, to save power. That'll be one of the bigger differences. Nice me again from uh, Journal du Geek in France. Uh, I had a simple question. Uh, at this time, do we have any games on iOS or Android or Windows Phone that can put uh, the Adreno 320 on its on its knees? And if not. What point is it to produce such a GPU if there's nothing capable of pushing it to its limits? I'm not sure I actually understand the question. Are you actually asking why we haven't broken it by pushing a game too hard? Or? No, actually, there, there's no <laughs> games actually right now available that would put uh, the latest GPU in the S4 Pro uh, to, its, to push I'm, it to I'm, its limits. Yeah, they're in the pipeline though. I mean, one of the things is you get this nice cycle where the gaming guys will look at what's really out there in the sweet spot of the marketplace and they'll build their engines around it. So we work with companies like Unity and those those folks who are really excited about the quad cores and the 300 series Adrenos because they can actually take the same games and actually make the rendering better. You saw in the demo that we did, you know, that what you can do if you just have that both the available CPU and the GPU available. So those things are actually in the pipeline. So you'll start seeing that kind of difference. Um, I think in the coming year. You also, uh, people use the GPU more broadly than just for games. They use it for uh, a lot of the animations in the UI, they use it on web, you know, on, on, on website rendering, uh, even more broadly uh, moving forward. So, 
you know, for us, we've we really uh, never seen people come to us and said, hey, that's really overkill in terms of, of what you're doing. As long as you, you know, do what we do essentially, which is we, we design it particularly for mobile. It's a completely different design that needs to be done to create the GPU that's needed in a phone versus the GPU that you might do for a different type of device. And so um, that's really why we did Adrena, is because it's a, it's a particular architecture which is done solely because the design point for, for mobile is different. And, um, you know, it's, it's worked out pretty well for us. We're continuing to invest pretty heavily in GPUs. It's really been uh, a key part of the high-end chipset. Hey, I'm Przemysław Spidersman from Poland. Uh, you come up with a lot of innovations um, in augmented reality, mobile health, and localization services. Uh, but um, when we see them in action, we know that they are very battery consuming, all of them. Uh, how far are we from some kind of a revolutionary breakthrough in, um, in battery technology that would make smartphones last more than just a daytime at the best? Because, well, I'm a heavy user of smartphones and, uh, you know, my smartphones usually run out after five to six hours. And uh, when I see such great innovations, I know that I will not be able to use them freely uh, on my smartphone because of the battery consumption. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think you got it right, which is that you, the, the you know, battery technology sort of advancing at this rate, the thirst for computing power is kind of going at this rate. There's a big gap in between. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen any battery technologies on the horizon that solve that gap uh, in the near term. One of the things that we've been doing is essentially, in addition to just managing the overall architecture for the lowest power and doing, you know, we, we have a completely different IP roadmap that allows us to get very low power for, for a particular performance level, but also integration itself and, and getting the smallest physical footprint um, allows you to trade off essentially board area for battery area. And today, what's interesting is that the um, you can just see it in the, some of the phones that, that Joe showed. They basically take anything that's not a chipset and uh, they make it battery. They, it's amazing how much, uh, how much they essentially squeeze the, the chipset down to the smallest possible areas they can trade it off for more battery. That's essentially what's happening now in terms of uh, moving it forward. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything on that yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the other thing that I think sometimes comes out, I mean, we, we talk a lot about how we design the CPU and the GPU standpoints too, but in some sense, we take a really a multi-tier approach to power consumption. Um, so, it, you know, at the chipset level, we're constantly thinking down to the level of the transistor, how do we manage the power, as Steve points out, for the mobile case. But then as you move up the layers, I think what you're experiencing is in large part driven by the fact that a lot of applications are now coming to mobile that aren't really designed with an understanding of what's expensive to do in a mobile. If you take an app that would run on a desktop, and in a fairly naive way, just bring it to the mobile broadband. Well, we've done a lot of work to make mobile broadband really fast, but it still does cost power to bring up that HSPA Plus or that LTE connection. So we've also been looking at machine learning and other kinds of techniques to help manage application connectivity. And you can also see the operating system guys doing this. So if you look at Windows 8, for example, has a whole lot of development around a thing called Connected Standby, which we work with Microsoft on, which lets the operating system work in conjunction with applications by putting you in a state where we know we want to save power and then wake up but in concert so that all the applications get their data at the same time and then go back to sleep. You do that kind of stuff, you can see 20 or 30 percent difference in kind of battery life. But you have to sort of either build it into the operating system or come up with a system that manages it overall. And I think that before you'll see a jump in battery technology, you'll, be, you'll see smarter and smarter management of sort of applications and connectivity, and then you combine that with Snapdragon's low, low PowerPoint, I think you're going to get, start to see some really great battery life. Probably got time for one more question. Hi, I'm um, Wout from the Netherlands, from Tweakers.net. Uh, during the keynote, you talked a bit about reference designs, and earlier this year, Intel created a reference design for their Medfield smartphone, and basically just and I don't know which company uh, it was, took the design and without making any alterations, created it into a phone 
So the Intel became more of like an ODM. Is that something that Qualcomm uh, also wants to do, or is it just the reference design on the hardware side on the platform? Yeah, we, we, have, um, we have tried very, very hard not to uh, put ourselves in conflict with our many, our many partners. We have uh, you know, just an enormous number of uh, chipset uh, customers today. And what, what the reference design is really in response to them asking us and saying for a particular tier of the market, we want to spend less on R&D in order to get that particular design. And, and really, it's for the, uh, for, in a lot of cases, it's for the portion of the market, um, the, you know, the so-called mass market smartphone part of the market. So they want to be able to go to market with very little R&D. But what we do, which is probably a little different than, than some others, is that we try to leave a lot of room for innovation by our OEM partners. And uh, we've done this for a number of years. You know, we've been doing this for some time in the chipset business. But on the reference design side, we essentially try to do the same thing. So we have different models depending on what the OEM partner wants to, wants to use. And, uh, but we're very, very careful not to uh, create conflict uh, between our partners and us. And by the way, it's worked out quite well. If you look at the, you look at the um, diversity of customers that we have, and the fact that we can deliver you know, hundreds of millions of chipsets a year across all these different networks, um, you know, it's worked out pretty well for us, actually, in terms of how we launch. One uh, quick follow-up, you just mentioned uh, the number of chipsets uh, you're putting out. How's production of the S4 at the moment? Because HCC was forced yeah. to uh, go back to the S3 for some uh, region, the 1S. So how's production at the moment? It's, um, you know, we've had, uh, we've just been remarkable how much demand we've had for the 28 nanometer parts. These are the first 28 nanometer parts in the industry. It's one of the reasons why uh, they have such uh, advanced performance and power characteristics. Um, and so we've been, we've been working on getting um, more supply as well as more suppliers for that chip uh, or for that series of chips. And um, we're essentially supply constrained right now, but exiting the calendar year will be matched between supply and demand. And so we're working very hard to try to make sure that we, number one, get more, more chips, but also get them to the right people so that they can launch these products. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've been just remarkably uh, uh, pleased with the reception, design-in reception that we've had with that chip. We've got to get through the, through the initial ramp, but uh, quite happy with how things have been going. Great, Steve, Rob, thank you very much for your time.